So welcome uh, everyone to the first uh, Earn Reconnect educational webinar for 2024. I'm uh, Emanuele Gotelli, I'm a research fellow in rheumatology at the University of Genova and uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Maurizio Cutolo, who is a professor of rheumatology and internal medicine at the Laboratories of Experimental Rheumatology and Academical Division of Clinical Rheumatology, always at the University of Genova. As you probably know, Maurizio Cutolo is a former president of EULAR, the European Alliance of Associations for Rheumatology, and of the ELAR, the International League of Associations for Rheumatology. Maurizio Cutolo serves as deputy chair for Erna Reconnet, and he is co-chair of the working group on education and training, to, together with Eric Achulla. And Maurizio Cutolo is the head of the Genoa webinar team, which deals with the planning and with the dissemination of the calendar uh, of educational webinars, together with the coordination team of PISA. And uh, throughout uh, this year, we have planned uh, 16 webinars, thanks to the collaboration of uh, all of you, patients, EPUGs, healthcare professionals. And uh, today we start uh, with the first uh, that is entitled Characterization of Pain in Connective Tissue Diseases and its management, everyone's problem. I remind uh, you uh, that you can send your questions using the question and answer and the chat boxes in the Zoom bar. And so I will mute and I ask Professor Cutolo to begin his presentation sharing his screen. Please, Professor Cutolo, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Emanuele. Thank you to all of you joining us. And um, as you know, this is addressed also to patients, my presentation. So we'll uh, present some, some at the beginning, difficult uh, aspect, but I will use very, I will try to use very, very easy words in order to make as easier possible to enter in this uh, very, very, very difficult field. That is the field of, uh, mm, of course, of uh, pain, pain in rheumatic diseases. So mm, if we consider uh, the concept of pain, the concept of pain is uh, a symptom, a very important symptom that we have, a sort of alarm, and is a signal of abnormality. Any kind of pain from any part of our body where it's not possible to appreciate pain and there is an abnormality here probably a big problem will arise soon because we cannot understand and feel this so generally anyway any kind of injury that may be trauma infections other causes induce in the tissues on the body an acute inflammation and uh, the inflammation may be solved or the inflammation may continue. But in any case, acute inflammation means pain and pain is a crucial signal of inflammation and damage. It's clear that uh, if we don't solve the problem, the persistence of stimuli and alter the response from the body especially near endocrine neural response, we will see how complex is the response. We move to the chronic inflammation. So the problem becomes chronic over time, over six months, nine months, one year. And here, any, in any case, the pain is still a crucial signal. But there is another possibility or other two possibilities, of course, the acute inflammation, the solution, the chronic inflammation, and uh, we can have a solving of the chronic inflammation, but this may induce insufficiency of the organ or invalidity of the organ. And this is when the chronicity become untreated properly. But another problem, very serious, and speci uh, specifically without pain, chronic inflammation may evolve, unfortunately, in cancer, in 50% of chronic cancer. And you know how many chronic disease become, unfortunately, for mutation, for altered angiogenesis, epigenetic changes became cancer with pain less evident. But let me go back to the problem of the pain. How the pain 
is a processor by the central nervous system. And so we know where is what is localized, probably how to we can modulate by ourselves, we will see in the pain management. We must know that all the causes I mentioned, they be mechanical in trauma or heat or cold or even a substance like red pepper and so on, induce a reaction in the tissues and the terminal part you see in the red, the terminal ter termination of the nerve capture this stimuli and react with the production locally of mediators of inflammation that means swelling, pain, and vasodilation, and so on. So it's clear that the area where the trauma is started, some signal start locally and maybe also diffusely in the body. What happened at the level of central nervous system? From the termination that I show you this uh, uh, sensitive nerve edging with the different mediators that you will have, okay, uh, start the transmission of the symptom that move from the periphery to the spine, of course, it's uh, this uh, uh, an important way inside the vertebral body. We have uh, the medulla, okay, with the spine and the nervous system. And here there is an important crossing. Here the stimuli, of course, may induce a secondary symptom um, um, signal and through the spine, the nerve arrive in the thalamic area and in, in, in the brain, in the cortex of the brain. This is the perception. Of course, the same symptom from the periphery may induce a reaction at the level of another system that is a system that induce locally what I told you. So the local uh, production of inflammation where the trauma was exerted. And so you see also the symptom of the cause of the pain. At the same time, of course, there is a, a reaction from the pain and there, the, there are uh, the uh, fiber that uh, at this point are efferent. So from the brain to the spinal cord, try to reduce the intensity. And we will see this is the production of serotonin, noradrenaline, the descending spinal pathway. So symptom from the periphery, announcement of the local causes of pain, perception of the pain in the central nervous system, and reaction of the brain, the nervous cells of system, trying to reduce as is possible the intensity of the pain. This is the classical, classical uh, pathway of the pain. So if we want try to synthesize Again, we can say that the, the pain from the periphery reports the pain to the brain, and the brain is conscious where is the pain. And so at this point, start a reaction in different area of the brain that I don't stay here to explain which one, but try, as I told you, to inhibit this pain, the brain itself, but is not so sufficient frequently. And even if not through the efferent pathway on the spine, also from another area of the brain, start the hyperproduction or release of cortisol, noradrenaline, so the involvement of the sympathetic nervous system and the um, the role of cortisone as an anti-inflammatory hormone, trying to downregulate this strong inflammatory cause of pain or other causes. So in few words, you can understand that the brain receives the signal of the pain, elaborate, try to understand better what kind of pain is and try to solve it by itself. So at this point is already clear that 
to try to block the pain too much early may induce a chronicity of the cause of pain and you mask the symptom but you don't resolve the cause of the pain okay this is a very important point very crucial point and sometimes the cause why chronic inflammation become cancer because we mask the symptom okay so all these components are in a normal condition where balanced the same sympathetic reactivity and the peripheral pro-inflammatory transmitters transmitters are in a ratio one to one while balanced but in condition inflammatory situations that may arise from pain from a trauma infection and so on the concentration of the substance that stimulate the nerve fibers to bring the symptom to the central nervous system is not anymore down regulated cooled by the system that i told you uh, from the brain itself try to down uh, reduce the intensity of the pain so without inflammation there is a good balancement in healthy condition but with inflammation here the capability of the body to react to the causes of pain is insufficient and here a very important aspect the circadian rhythm of pain all the patients with rheumatic diseases any kind or disease they know that have during the day different intensity of the pain much more in the morning a little in the evening of course sometime during the night and during the day it's less than in the morning why this is due to the way the two important kind of pain the acute or chronic pain are uh, modulated by the central nervous system so in acute pain when we have uh, the beginning of the acute pain especially during the gout that is the time we have the lowest cortisone production in our body and so we are really incapable to react very well to the acute gout or to pain due to inflammation infection during the night is a real problem because the endogenous system of reactivity to the pain i mentioned it to you from the brain stimuli to produce cortisol for example noradrenaline is inefficient and so same story in chronic disease we have any kind of chronic disease not just rheumatic disease same story the pain is much stronger in the night melatonin for example is the nonsense enhance the pain and the cortisol during the night counteracts the action of melatonin and reduce the pain so we have a discontinuous alternance every night production of mediators of pain and if there is a chronic inflammation acute inflammation that we are not enable able with our systems to downregulate in the morning is a disaster and so in the morning for example early in the morning in rheumatoid arthritis the symptoms are the highest possible with the highest pain and incapability to move at the beginning then start the production of, of cortisol or start the action of the drugs we use and during the day the patients stay well but in the night is the uh, highest condition to prepare the pain in the morning and so in the morning in rheumatoid arthritis but also in polymyalgia and spondylarthritis axial spondylitis they want now axial spondylitis you have a strong inflammation where there is the synovial tissue and you have such kind of alternance and circadian rhythm but not all the kind of pain are similar we have a different kind of pain with different causes even if at the end the pain is unpleasant in any case one kind quite frequent 
is the most frequent type of chronic pain, pain is a neuropathic pain that is due to the uh, damage, lesion, or disease itself, like herpes or diabetes, that uh, interacts with uh, fibers of the nervous system, either in the periphery or even centrally. This is a neuropathic, neuropathic pain. Then we have a nociceptive pain. This is a classical caused by the damage of a tissue, maybe a trauma, maybe also uh, uh, any kind of uh, really uh, uh, damage, real damage. So this is classical in joint, muscle, tendon, bones. And in this case, we can say that the pain is of course a signal of something wrong, but also serve as a protective function because the patient with such kind of uh, uh, damage area of the bone of the body try to reduce the activity as a serve as a protective function. Then we have the radicular pain, the classic sciatica. The radicular pain is uh, the pain that uh, arise when the spinal nerve are compressed or inflamed, classical hernia, and we call this radiculopathy. Nothing to do, for example, with the nociceptive pain. It's quite different because it's the direct compression, compression on the nerves. But there are other mm. kinds of pain. We mentioned the pain of inflammation. This is very complex because the involvement of different mediators, biochemical mediators, is the pain that we have in rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, tendinitis, and we treat today with the target therapies on the causes. And when we treat well the causes and we treat well rheumatoid arthritis, pain disappear. But there is also a pain that is not inflammatory, not neuropathic, not infectious, and this is the pain of fibromyalgia. This is a diffuse form of pain. Here is very interesting to consider the essence of the pain in fibromyalgia, because here, related also to the personality of the patient, we mix different kind of pain diffuse pain that it may involve the muscles, the skin, the joint, even internal organs. So there are at least seven types of fibromyalgia pain. And it's most likely that patient will experience at the same time several of this kind of fibromyalgia pain. What I mean, the fibromyalgia symptoms may be present like hyperalgesia. So there is a low threshold of pain and the termination, the receptor, feel pain, everything. Or widespread muscle pain and fatigue. Here, the insufficient adrenal gland to furnish enough energies, cortisone, noradrenaline may be one of the cases of the such kind of uh, asthenia or temporomandibular joint pain that may be also due to particularly tension of the muscles. Or allodynia is another difficult to treat way to, of perception of the pain. Of course, neuropathic pain it's present when there is also associated a cause and fibromyalgia may be a secondary syndrome or pain that is added to a neuropathic pain. But also at age is another symptom of uh, fibromyalgia with particular uh, painful condition and continuous headaches. And we well know also how the stress induced uh, uh, the uh, muscles, hyperactivity, abdominal and pelvic pain with a lot of 
irritable bowel or stomach symptoms that should be treated on the basis of the problem. And this is a special condition of pain, the causes of pain in fibromyalgia. But what we have to do in presence of chronic or localized pain as a patient at the beginning, as a patient, as we know, most part of the pain is a normal response to a cause that we have already diagnosed. For example, I get a trauma with my hands or a excessive pressure or my shoes are too small and I know why now the feet are painful and so on. So this is a real normal response and it doesn't require a further trip to the doctor and to understand. You reduce the causes by yourself and you solve. But what happened? If he, uh, the pain is a, the signal of something much more serious that you don't understand very well, what to do? At this point, it's very important that if you see that the pain finished and uh, the time that needed to reduce is related to the reason you can understand, the cause you can understand, and the cause also is known, no need of many further investigation, I mean intensive investigation, but if the pain is severe, continuous, it's, uh, you don't understand why this pain, a pain on the thorax that is continuous, severe, it's important to contact the doctor before to use strong painkillers that delay the intervention and the need to understand the cause. So painkillers should use after someone has investigated the cause. This is really important. Because what you can do by yourself, uh, considering all I told you, you can say that you may do by yourself, patient, an approach of a combination of different atomic remedies, uh, cold, ice, you can do by yourself this and try if it's clear the cause to reduce or uh, the, you are in an anxious, depressed, and any cause of um, trauma may induce a strong pain. And so it's important to try to use something that reduce your anxieties. But sometimes it seems strange, but exercise may help because exercise or massage uh, induce some of the efferent uh, pathway from the area and move to the brain and reduce the sense of pain. You know very well when you have a pain, you try to compress the area to massage, and in some way you reduce the pain because you activated a natural way of downregulation of the pain. But there are also several hands on treatment. Some people like agopuncture, massage, I already told you, chiropractic, but everything should be done after it's clear the reason for such kind of body pain. Injections, local injections, is a tendon, it's a knee during an inflammatory well-known condition helps. Lifestyle changes, maybe the diet, reduce the extra weight, and drinking water, if as a reason, metabolic reason, and manage the stress again. So to change the lifestyle, it increase the anxiety, or it's by self a cause of chronic pain in obese, overweight. It's much easier to reduce the weight than to take everyday painkiller because then the side effects you will see sooner after increase of blood pressure, gastric distress, and so on. 
But what about the bevication? And here is the most delicate point. You have a lot of different level of painkiller, just painkillers, painkillers as anti-inflammatory drugs, and move, move to steroid and move to opioid, move to morphine. So you have a stratification of different approaches. The same uh, way to approach that we have discussed until now must um, induce at the beginning you and the doctor to approach in a different way. It's clear that painkiller are important, anti-inflammatory are important, but if you have a possible an infection, you have to use also antibodies and the and antibodies, sorry, antibiotics and the best antibiotic. You have a problem in the mouth, you have a, a problem of the infection in the hand. It's not sufficient to use the painkillers. You have to cause, in any case, treat the causes. But using such pain relieving opioids is another very delicate and dangerous way to approach that it's much better the doctor decide of course unfortunately if your if your the pain is related to cancer maybe this uh, way to use but not before to know the cause in conclusion the key messages are that we must say thank you pain as <laughs> strange but thank you pain because pain is signal from periphery or something is wrong for your nervous system, central nervous system. Alert the central nervous system and is elaborate. The brain try to understand from where. So pain is well accepted at the beginning. Then, especially particularly localized pain as a symptom, maybe acute chronic, but must be serious managed every 24 hours when the cause is established and diagnosed. The early treatment of pain, too early because the diagnosis induce delay in understanding the origin, delay, of course, in the diagnosis, and delay for the correct treatment. Sometimes when infection or other causes may be treated on time if we know the cause, but we mask the cause for days and weeks, we severely damage our body, our condition, and our present and future maybe. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. And of course, I. I'm ready to receive your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kutolo. And uh, we received uh, two very interesting questions. Uh, the first is, thank you for an excellent talk. I would be very interested in Dr. Kutro's thoughts on the findings of autoantibodies and the neutrophils affecting attacking binding to peripheral small neuron diameter small fiber ganglia and is causing the pain signals in fibromyalgia, referring to the passive transfer studies done by Goebel and colleagues. Yes, this is a very important point. Uh, the majority of the disease are, have an immune mediated reason. And antibodies plays an important role. We have two categories of antibodies. The antibodies is the marker or consequence of the reaction against antigens. So they take part of the adaptive immunity. But we have another categories of antibodies, much more dangerous. They are the so-called functional antibodies. So antibodies that participate to the pathop physiology of the disease. And in several disease, the majority of these antibodies appear before the symptom and interfere with the progression, the early progression of disease, like in this case, but in many other diseases. For example, in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, the anti-CCP antibodies, antibodies against the normal citrullinated peptide of collagen, 
fibrinogen, uh, vimentine, tenacin, may appear also 15, one, five years before the disease and start to play a local pro-inflammatory action on the synovial tissue, then start the early symptoms. Or in systemic sclerosis, and especially in the consequence, antibodies against uh, an endothelin-1 receptor or angiotensin receptors are involved in uh, hypertension and a important role in the development of vasoconstriction. And dotelin is a vasoconstrictive as angiotensin. Also, may have our present in systemic sclerosis in older autoimmune disease anti-estrogen receptor agonist antibodies. They play like estrogen. So enhance the estrogen action of the immune cells uh, that induce an increased production of autoantibodies and immune response. So your question is in the part of the functional antibodies, it's really important. Uh, targeted therapies against um, antibodies, natural antibodies maybe will develop. But in these cases, in any case, the downregulation, the immune response, and the production antibody at the end act also on such kind of functional antibody. So the use of rituximab, for example, in some cases, abatacept may reduce the enhanced activity of the adaptive immune system, the production of, of antibodies, and downregulate also such kind of function of autoantibodies that interfere with the pathophysiology of the disease. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Puttolo. And uh, you spoke about estrogens and you anticipated the second questions. That is, I also hear Dr. Scutolo thoughts on the impact of female sex hormones on pain, given that so many women who develop fibromyalgia type pain do so during perimenopause and menopause. And also, does serotonin fluctuations affect pain in this scenario? Yes. Thank you. Good question. Very good. Uh, the pineal gland produce important hormones. And uh, some of them are pro-inflammatory, like melatonin, prolactin, and so on. Uh, there is a circadian production of melatonin, we know, and is part of the pro-inflammatory machinery that every night, of course, induces also to sleep. But you know very well that melatonin is a very complex hormone. And same story for prolactin, especially for the inflammation-related pain after the delivery, the high production of prolactin in order to induce the lactation, and uh, the flare-up of many autoimmune diseases after the delivery. What about the menopause? In the menopause, the production of estrogen is peripheral, in the peripheral tissues. It's not anymore for ovaries, of course, and is produced by the action of the aromatase on androgens, especially in the outer epiandrosterone, but also the remnant testosterone that is present also in female. So there is a peripheral production of estrogen, estrogen metabolites. And the estrogen metabolites, like 60 uh, alpha hydroxylated estrogens, are potent enhancer of the production by peripheral cells like macrophages of TNF-alpha, IL-1, IL-6. So as you can understand, the rheumatoid arthritis that develop, or rheumatoid or autoimmune disease develop after menopause, are not anymore dr um, driven by the gonads, but by the high production of estrogens, the role that estrogen had is the only part, of course, of the causes, of course, but a role as epigenetic factor that may announce, together with other risk factors, the, uh, uh, the beginning of the disease. Of course, other factors induce, for example, stress, and so reduce capability of the adrenal gland to produce cortisol, adrenaline, that I mentioned it as important um, uh, firemen in our body to reduce the inflammation. So it's clear that dynamic of the sex hormones are uh, important. Recently, 
uh, two days ago has been published in Arthritis and Rheumatism, an important study that evaluated the perception of pain rheumatoid arthritis, female versus male, as was well seen that in female, at least for the acute pain, is published last month, I think, or this month, uh, is much higher the perception of pain in uh, female patients, in women. So there is also gender difference in appreciation of pain that is related to hormones, but also to other uh, factor, intellectual factor, cultural factor, and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cutolo. And uh, now the further question is about uh, the problem of insomnia in chronic pain. What about it? <laughs> insomnia in chronic pain uh, is... Uh, uh, has at, at least three reasons. Uh, the chronic pain itself, uh, because as I mentioned it, the highest um, production of inflammatory mediator inflammation during the night or the evening and night, because in the night, we don't use calories, energies for body functions, but a lot of calories are available for the inflammatory reaction, see the acute grout, see the allergies, see the pain in rheumatoid arthritis. So early in the morning, all of these calories announce the immune response. So it's clear that pain induces insomnia. Then there is an altered uh, ratio between cortisol and melatonin. And uh, the sequence of cortisol and melatonin is completely altered, especially if the patient takes corticosteroids in the evening or afternoon, that's absolutely wrong, absolutely wrong, in chronic condition, eh? in chronic condition, not in acute, in chronic condition. Never take your steroids after foods in the evening because this high concentration of cortisol physiologically inhibit the production of melatonin. And so melatonin cannot induce the somnol the sleeping, because you put a cascade of cortisone during the day and melatonin cannot work regularly. But this uh, role of circadian rhythm is very clear during the jet lag, for example. During the jet lag, we, we do a long flight and we stay eating and listening music or chatting and the light in airplane, if it's not well controlled, in Lufthansa, very well controlled, uh, you get much more cortisol than melatonin. And so if you have a chronic condition, during the flight, you stay better because the continuous stimuli to produce cortisol, if you have it in your body. But difficult then to sleep for hours, for days after, because you disrupted the rhythm of melatonin cortisol, due also to the jet lag, but due also to the time of difference. So every time you disturb or go to sleep too late due to the chronic pain or the reason uh, melatonin do not work correctly. So I told you just three reasons why there is insomnia in the night, different causes, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. And another question is, what is the role of the diet and dietary interventions in pain management, especially talking about estrogen? Does the patient need to regulate the diet to include less phytoestrogens and foods high in estrogen to better manage chronic pain conditions, for example, in lupus patients? Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is another very, very important question because um, we know that uh, estrogens are uh, metabolized by the macrobioma, our goods. Then three billions of bacteria we have inside. And inside the gut, we have the meeting between the macrobioma and the immune system. 70%, 70% of our system is inside the gut. So here, start a lot of disease from the allergies to the strawberry to the spondyloarthritis in uh, Crohn disease and so on, so on, so on. So the role of nutrients is fundamental to do this. But, and I tell you, but also the gut is able to metabolize 
estrogen and androgens. And the food rich of phytoestrogens. So not real estrogen, but with the sharing very action, it's one of the problem linked, for example, to the large use of soya. There are people that you ask, do you drink milk? Yes, I drink a lot of milk. I mean, for your osteoporosis. Yes, I drink a lot of milk. Milk, uh, cow, sheep milk? No, no, no. Soya milk. Oh, this is another story. Here, if you have good health, maybe improve, increase your estrogen-like compound hormones. But if you have a chronic inflammation, Soya is not so suggested. And so even uh, many foods and um, additive of the foods are treated with estrogen-like uh, compound. Even in the plastic of the blood bottles, there are some estrogen-like compound. So reduce in chronic autoimmune, autoimmune disease to reduce the introduction of estrogens any kind of estrogen is important. I don't mention, of course, the use of estrogen replacement for the treatment of menopause, that is a disaster, as well as in young girl, especially in lupus, the use of a coral contraception, especially rich in estrogens. So in lupus patients, even estrogens are one of the main causes of the disease that's frequent in young and girl. Nine to one the ratio, so you can understand by yourself how may play a role in the complex risk factors the type of situation that may induce the autoinflammation and autoimmunity. And so it's clear that foods like meat, red meat, you know the animal are treated with estrogens in order to let proliferate the cells. This is uh, dangerous, very dangerous to eat too much meat. Much better the fish, in this case, to introduce animal proteins or other sources of proteins like legumes and so on. But estrogens must be reduced as much as possible in chronic autoimmune diseases. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cutolo. We don't have uh, any more questions, but uh, as as moderator, I have a last uh, question. That is, uh, what about uh, circanorrhea? Not, uh, not before the slide, Because we ah, the classical answer question. No, I don't know what he's asking. No, no. no. What about a circanual rhythm of pain? Sorry? What about a circanual rhythm? Ah, pain? circanual. Ah, ah. Uh, ah, you won't test me, my knowledge. So uh, the circadian is another fascinating problem because um, again related to nutrition, again related to the climate, again related to the different foods during the season, if you eat the seasonal food, you change the compound, the nutrients that may partially play a role in the causes of inflammation and so of pain. One example for everyone. For example, we know very well that psoriasis and partially related arthritis improve in summer. Why? And this is clear now because in summer, for people that stay on the sun, of course, people they say inside the bull, no. But the higher production of D hormone that you know as a strain structure of cortisol reduce the inflammation, the cell proliferation, and so as a consequence, the disease and the eventual pain related to such kind of lesions. So in this case, you have a circanol uh, um, written. Uh, but for some other disease, there are other, other factors that may influence. For example, 
the intensity of the pressure, the atmospheric pressure. When you have high pressure or low pressures, and uh, that are uh, during the summer or winter of clear. And the uh, baroceptors, the receptor in our body for the pressure that are linked also to the perception of pain, feel self difference, especially with people that I mentioned with a low threshold of pain. People with ansia, depression, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is much worse with stress in winter, in summer when you are in vacation. For some people, fibromyalgia disappear. You're in vacation with a nice partner. You do exercise, you enjoy the sun, foods, fibromyalgia disappear. Then you come back at work, fibromyalgia comes again. So it's clear that the threshold of pain is very important. Of course, Musio Shevola put his arm on the fire because he was affected by Tabe dorsalis, a disease that killed the spinal cord capability to perception of the pain. That's why I told you that it's important to have the pain because you don't touch too hot or too cold uh, subject, um, objects, for example, or you feel if there is burning something. He was unable to feel the hot or the fire. And so he said, I'm a strong man. Look my arm in the fire. But this is, was a neurological disease. <laughs> but if you have a normal nervous system, uh, the pain, it's a way even for circadian rhythm of the climate, the temperature, uh, to modulate the heating. And the heat, the warm season, very hot, may induce vasodilation. And so in arthritis, may induce more edema and even more inflammation because there is a highest production and diffusion of the inflammatory mediators. On the other hand, at least for acute secondary pain, the cold with vasoconstriction, the cold in winter may be a sort of natural circannual therapy uh, for some kind of sufferance, especially if you are outside and you live in contact with the nature. Thank you. So this was the last question. Thank you very much again to Professor Cutolo for this uh, exhaustive discussion on pain in rheumatic diseases. And uh, thanks to all of you, to the audience for the questions. And uh, you are all invited to the next uh, Erna Reconnect educational webinar, which will be held on February 28th, the same time. And it will regard the childhood onset systemic lupus erythematosus. See you soon and uh, good evening to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye to everyone. <laughs>